I think it's undeniable that Splatoon has one of the most interesting and unique worlds out of any shooter game. There's just so much lore to explore that makes every aspect of the game, including the gameplay, all connected and intertwined. Fans of the series such as myself have worked their asses off to understand every aspect of the world, and it seems like we have a pretty solid understanding of just about everything. Except for one thing. Hi, I'm Keegan Rainey, a biology undergrad at Bridgewater State University, captain of the BSU Splatoon team Gristico, and biology and Splatoon fanatic. Today I wanted to take a deeper dive into one of the most fascinating parts of Splatoon in my opinion. The characters. Not the characterization of the characters themselves, but of the biology of their species as a whole. Specifically their anatomy and physiology. Not only do I think that this is just fun for the sake of it and to understand the world of Splatoon a bit better, but also because we all might be able to learn something along the way. But first, we need some background information to get us started. The playable characters in Splatoon are divided into two different species, known as the Inklings and Octolings. Functionally, these two species are the same, their primary differences being tentacle style, ear shape, and how their eyes connect or do not. Other than those few visual differences, the species are the same and share the same characteristics and abilities. Both species have two different forms, humanoid form, sometimes referred to as kid form, and squid form, or swim form. When in humanoid form, inklings and octolings have the basic playable functions, such as moving and jumping. However, once they enter squid form, they have a different set of functions. For instance, when in contact with their ink color, they can swim faster and climb up walls. Alright, now that we understand the basics of the inklings and octolings, we can move on to the real juicy details, because that honestly didn't give us much to work with. So let's take a quick look at some other characteristics of the species. Wait, hold on a second. What just happened? As fascinatingly curious as that all was, I think it gives us quite a bit of evidence to determine what exactly the anatomy of Inklings is, so let's break it down one step at a time. One of the most questionable traits of Inklings and Octolings is that, despite being species of squids and octopuses, they don't seem to be able to swim in water and are completely terrestrial. Imagine this happening in real life, dropping a squid into water only for it to instantly die and dissipate into the water? Huh, that's interesting, but it kind of reminds me of something. When you pour water into water, what happens? Well, obviously, you get more water. When you pour Minute Maid into water, what do you get? You get watered down Minute Maid. Or Minute Maid it down water if you want to be weird. Either way, the Minute Maid mixes into the water. But what happens when you pour oil into water? Let's take a look. Well that's odd. The oil didn't mix with the water. It kind of just stays its own thing. Why is that? To answer that, let's learn some science. We all know that a molecule of water consists of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. These atoms of a water molecule are held together by what we call covalent bonds. To understand covalent bonds, we need to understand the structure of an atom. Atoms are made up of three different subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. These different subatomic particles are charged differently, protons being positive, neutrons being neutral, and electrons being negatively charged. The protons and neutrons are packed into a nucleus, while the electrons hover around the nucleus, giving us this iconic shape. Atoms have a tendency to try to stay neutral, to have an equal amount of protons and electrons so they cancel each other out. But this sometimes doesn't happen. When an atom is not neutrally charged, they become what is known as an ion, and ions can interact with each other, such as by sharing valence electrons, or the electrons on the outermost ring, between the atoms, a covalent bond. What's interesting about water's covalent bond is that the sharing of electrons isn't evenly distributed, and the oxygen atom sort of hoards the electrons, which causes the oxygen to be slightly negatively charged, and the hydrogens slightly positively charged. This uneven distribution of charges makes water a polar molecule. The thing about oils is that they are not polar, otherwise known as non-polar. Okay, so water is a polar molecule and oil is a non-polar molecule. So why does oil not mix with water? Polar molecules like water and Minute Maid are unevenly charged, like we just learned. And because of that charge, they have a tendency to attract to one another, because opposite charges attract. Non-polar molecules are ignored by polar molecules, because they don't have charges, so they kind of just do their own thing when mixed with polar molecules. And this is actually somewhat true for actual squid ink. Now let's bring this all back to Splatoon. The question we are still left with is, why can't Inklings swim? 
Considering what we just learned, I believe that the reason Inklings and Octolings cannot swim is because their skin and tentacles are made up of a non-polar substance. Kind of. I think their skin, ink, and tentacles are amphipathic. Amphipathic molecules are molecules that are polar in some areas and non-polar in others. And this is actually how the membranes of our own cells work. The membranes are the part of the cell that protect everything inside, selectively letting in and out resources when needed. The lipids that make up our cells are amphipathic, with polar heads and non-polar tails, meaning that the heads are hydrophilic and are attracted to water, whereas the tails are hydrophobic and are repelled from water. When in an aqueous environment, these lipids will come together in such a way that keeps the tails on the inside and heads on the outside of the membrane. So I propose that the in-game species are made up similarly to how our cells are, which would also somewhat explain why they dissipate into the water the way that they do. But I can already hear some of you asking, but Keegan, all of your examples have been about liquids, what a- You ever heard of Ooblek? The fact that Inklings can do this is very interesting to me. We know that Inklings have to be at least somewhat solid because they don't take the shape of their container. At least not all of the time. So I think it's safe to assume Inklings are something like Ooblek, a combination of cornstarch and water that can act as either a solid or a liquid. In the same sense, I think that Inklings are solid-like in humanoid form and liquid-like in squid form. And I also think it's safe to assume that, unlike real squids, Inklings have some sort of skeletal structure based on this physique. So if they have a skeleton, then how are they able to do this? To answer this question, I'm gonna hit you with a POP QUIZ! How many bones do sharks have? If you guess none, then you'd be correct! Shark skeletons are actually made up of cartilage, the stuff our noses are mostly made of. Not bones. Cartilage is less dense than bones, so it makes it easier for sharks to swim fast through water. So for the same reason, I think it makes sense that inkling skeletons would also be made of the same thing. It's still weird that they'd even have skeletons to begin with, though. But anyway, that still doesn't answer our question. Just because cartilage is less dense doesn't mean it can just phase through surfaces, so how can inklings do that? Well, let's look at another animal to come up with a hypothesis that we can't really test because I'm over here talking about a fictional species from a kid's shooter game and not a real animal, so there's no real way to test my hypotheses. I've gone insane. Everyone here likes cats, right? I sure hope you do because I've seen what little Judd does to people who don't like him. We've all also seen cats do some pretty nifty stuff too, right? Like how they can fit through seemingly impossibly small openings. Of course, that's just one of the many fascinating things about cats that makes us all love them so much. It turns out the reason they can do this is because their spines and shoulders are incredibly flexible, being able to bend and move to accommodate for any opening. Similarly, I believe that inkling skeletal structure is made up of mostly non-conjoined cartilage. Pair that with the oobleck-like consistency of their skin, and you've got something that can mold into tiny holes such as this. Now you may be wondering why I specified that their skeletons are likely mostly non-conjoined. And, well, I want you to look me in the eyes and tell me that these are the exact same skeletal structure. Okay, now we have plausible explanations as to why Inklings and Octolinks can selectively permeate through some surfaces and can't swim in water. That still leaves us with a pretty big question. Of course, every fictional world comes with its fair share of moments where you just have to suspend your disbelief to have fun. To many people, the ability for Inklings and Octolinks to change their ink colors is just something they can do. It doesn't have to be realistic, but it is. I truly believe that they could be able to do something like this in reality. Well, not the squids we have today, but if Inklings were real, then it is possible. How, you may be asking, is it possible? Well, I had two ideas, the first of which is an ability squids already possess. Squids are really good at camouflage, so couldn't their ability to change ink color just be camouflage? But no, I thought, because that wouldn't make sense since they're also unable to swim in ink of different colors, and they also take damage when hit with another color of ink. That's where my second idea came in. Just about every living thing, every cell on Earth, has DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA are the molecules that are what can be considered the code for an organism. DNA is made up of sugar phosphate backbones that hold together the nitrogenous bases. Together, as nucleotides, they carry the information needed to replicate and build an organism. There are four different types of nucleotides, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Adenine can only pair with thymine, and guanine can only pair with cytosine, and vice versa. DNA is composed of different combinations of those nucleotides. Three nucleotides code for an amino acid, 
different combinations of amino acids create different proteins. And the part of the DNA that codes for a specific part of the organism, for instance, hair color, is called a gene. All of the DNA of an organism makes up the organism's genome. An organism's genotype is its specific combination of nucleotides, and what that genotype codes for is considered a phenotype. To help you understand, the code for an organism is its genotype, whereas the characteristics the organism expresses is its phenotype. In Splatoon, it would make sense that the characters have parts of their genome that code for their ink color. But since the inklings can change what color their ink is, I don't think that ink color is hereditary, or passed down from their parents. But rather, I believe that every inkling has the ability to express every different color of ink in the game, and what determines the color of ink they have is how their genes are expressed. You see, not every part of an organism's genome can be expressed, and not every gene that can be expressed always is. A very basic form of this is seen literally all the time in our very own bodies. Every replicating cell in our body carries our entire genome. Which not only is crazy to think about, it's even cooler because only the part of the genome that makes up any particular type of cell is expressed when and where they're needed. Your nerve cells have the information for your fingernail cells, but they only express the part of the genome that makes your nerve cells, and only when they need to. That's one form of gene expression. Another form of gene expression comes in the form of response to an organism's environment. This change of gene expression in response to the variability within the organism's environment is what is known as phenotypic plasticity. My favorite example of phenotypic plasticity is with rabbits. In warmer months, many rabbits have dark fur color, often brown or black. But many of those same rabbits shed that fur and grow a light-colored fur in the colder months when there's snow on the ground. This is an example of phenotypic plasticity. Different conditions in the rabbit's environment result in the genes of the rabbit being expressed differently. This happens so rabbits can camouflage with their environment to avoid being detected by predators. When it comes to the expression of ink colors within inklings and octolings, maybe different external conditions allowed them to change the color of their ink. What exactly those conditions would be, I'm not sure. I don't think we have enough evidence to really determine what those conditions would be, and much less what conditions result in the expression of which colors. As to why inklings take damage from and cannot swim in different colors of ink, may be due to the genes that produce different ink colors code for different lipid structures that cannot interact with each other. I think most of the big questions about the anatomy of inklings have been more or less sufficiently answered for the time being. We determined that inklings and octolings may be made up of nonpolar or phospholipid-like skin and tentacle cells that act similarly to oobleck, that they might have non-conjoined cartilage skeletal systems, and that the variability in the ink colors they express could be due to phenotypic plasticity. But hey, that's just a theory! No. No it's not. I would never be so bold as to put my stupid analysis of the funny squid game on the same level as theories such as the theory of evolution, theory of gravity, cell theory, or germ theory. That would be wildly irresponsible of me, perpetuating a common misconception about what a theory means in science. And while I have your attention, I might as well clear up some confusion around the subject. A theory isn't just a guess. It's an explanation of things we see in our universe that all of our best evidence supports. And a theory doesn't become a law once it's been proven. Firstly, nothing is really ever proven in science. We just continue to fail to disprove our hypotheses before we can accept something. Secondly, theories and laws are two different things. Laws explain what happens in our world, such as the law of universal gravitation, F equals G M1 times M2 over R squared, where you can plug any numbers into there and get a result. Whereas a theory is a functional explanation of some part of our world, such as the theory of evolution, which explains the biodiversity of life we see on our planet. Anyway, that's all from me right now. I hope we were all able to learn something today. You should go get Splatoon 3, it's a fun game. If you want some entertaining Splatoon videos to watch, then might I suggest you subscribe to the Ranny YouTube channel, at TGP Ranny. No pressure, of course. Bye!